Hello to all God's precious people out there in Radio Land. This is Sylvia Pierce on The Liberating Secret. I'm so glad to be with you today. I've been going through the book of Hebrews and last yesterday that uh, when we taught, we read to you the, at your affirmation of faith. And like I said, that, that comes from uh, the Hebrews uh, verse in chapter 4, 14. It says, Seeing then you have, you have a great high priest who, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession of faith. So um, I encourage you to get on our websites, either one, theliberatingsecret.org or spiritbroadcasting.net. And you will find a link to where I have all these scriptures and this affirmation of faith listed for you to read. And it such it does it just builds you up in Christ and who you really are. So um, I encourage you to get on our websites and get that affirmation of faith. But you're hearing me by radio. Um, you then um, write me, and I will I'll send it to you free. So, but you have to tell me exactly what you want because. I've done hundreds of these programs, and I do offer things occasionally, so I can't re really remember which one I've offered you. So don't say, well, the, what you offered free. You've got to tell me what it is. So it's affirmation of faith. So, um, and I know that will encourage you. And I, I believe if the Hebrew Christians had read that, that would have encouraged them too, because um, it certainly builds us up in the most holy faith of who we really are in Christ. And um, um, it reminds me of, um, of the Ephesians, in the Ephesians letter. I love this because it's in um, chapter 4 of Ephesians, and I'm going to take a little sidestep here because um, I, I just want to read to you uh, some truths there in chapter 4 of Ephesians. It says this, that there is one body, one spirit, even as we are called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And that's, of course, talking to the redeemed. So, you see, oneness is not a theme that the Liberating Secret or Christ Our Life Ministry came up with. It's certainly biblical. Jesus' uh, prayer in John 17 he prays for the oneness of the corporate body as well as your personal oneness with, your, with, with him, himself. So, but listen to what it says. The three, three things that are joined as one. One body. So he, he says in other places that there's not any more Jew and Gentile. It's one. We're, we're joined together as one. And I always say, instead of us trying to be one in the body of Christ, so we know there's many factions and divisions, and that's because we're still carnal and not understanding who we are. Start standing in the truth that we are one unified body of Christ, regardless of how it looks. Start taking that by faith. Pray that prayer. And I think what we're facing in our nation, you see, we're always trying to change things on the political arena. I think we need to stand together firmly as Christians, regardless of which church you go to or which uh, denomination that you adhere to, start realizing that by faith there really is only one body. There is no division and schism in Christ and because it actually says that. And we need to grow up into that realization. And that's what the perfecting of the saints really means. Listen to that. One body... One Holy Spirit, the Spirit's not divided up into a million pieces. Even as there is one hope of your calling, there's only one, and that's Jesus. One Lord, that's Jesus Christ. One faith, there's not a million faith, faiths. One baptism, so it doesn't, you know, all this wrangling we do about how we're baptized. One God and Father of us all. <laughs> He, who is above all and through all and in you all. And uh, so we need to stop wrangling about all the different divisions and start realizing that we really are one unified, multi-membered body of Christ. And as we realize that and take it by faith, 
you see, and uh, uh, let go of all the minor little things that we might not agree on. There is never anywhere that I'm going to go that I'm going to agree with every single solitary thing, and you won't either, because individually God has given you certain things, and that's fine if, there, if you have that certain thing. Don't blame somebody else because they don't have it. It's yours to give. You give it, and quit blaming other people because they don't see it. And I'm talking to myself as well, I want you to know today. Now listen to this. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So when he ascended up on high, you see, this is, this is when he did it. When he was ascended, and that's what the Hebrews letter is saying, we have a high priest that has ascended. He is an ascended Lord. I mean, the very proof that he was the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, come in human flesh that's gained the victory, the captain of our salvation, made perfect through suffering. The very proof of that was that he was raised from the dead and now he has ascended into the heavenlies, interceding until his enemies be made his footstool. That's what it says in Romans and also it says it in Hebrews. And, um, and it says, Wherefore, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now that he ascended, that is, but that he also descended first to the lower parts of the earth. He went to Sheol, to Hades, to bring all the believing uh, uh, Jews, really, that believed in Abraham's bosom. He opened heaven's gate when he went to hell, the lower parts of the earth, to bring um, everyone that had believed. Because he was the beginning, the first in the, uh, of many brethren you know, come into the heavenly realm. And, and you see, we wouldn't be able to be in the heavenly realm if Jesus were not in the heavenly realm. And it's because we are in him that we are already in the heavenly realm. Now, I know we always talk about going to heaven and how great it's going to be. We need to start realizing that we are already in the heavenly realm in Christ and that he has that heavenly realm inside of us in spirit. We need to start realizing that and st stop looking into the future. I mean, that's wonderful, but, and we're not coming against that or saying that's not true, but we really need to realize the full impact of the heavenly realm within us right here and now in Christ. And it says, he descended to the same, he that descended is the same that ascended far above heavens and filled all things and gained the victory of our resurrection and ascension. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers fivefold ministry. What is our job? And I'm, I'm saying our because I say the Lord has called me to be a teacher. Okay, what, what, what am I to teach? If I'm not teaching you who you really are in Christ and the truth concerning you and the, concerning the new covenant, I'm not teaching you the fullness of the gospel. That's my job. Why? It's the next verse says it. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. If your minister or preacher is making you feel condemned because you're not doing this and not doing that, he's not edifying you. He's not telling, he's putting you under some kind of fleshly law. When we're freed from that fleshly performance and we're raised into the heavenlies with Christ and it's all grace now, People, people say, oh, then that's a license to sin. Well, you don't understand grace. We have a really a license not to sin <laughs> because we're dead to it. And it says to edify the body of Christ until, see, our job as the fivefold ministry is only meant to be here for a short period of time. Until, until what? Until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of, of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. You see, Christ is already that fullness within us. But as long as in, inside of us we don't realize it or have the know, knowing of it, you see, this is all about what we know and what we don't know. If we've never been taught the full, that Christ lives in fullness in you, then you think you're full of yourself and therefore you have to improve yourself all the time. The job of the minister is to tell you that Christ was raised from the dead, the old 
uh, man was crucified with Christ and uh, his job is to tell you that you've been raised with Christ into a heavenly realm and that heavenly realm has now been imparted to you and you're partakers now of his divine nature. And um, as the body of Christ comes to that knowledge that we already are a unified, multi-membered body of Christ. We already are. There's only one body, the Bible says. See, it's only in our minds that we're seeing division. Why do we still live in such division in our mind? It's because, it's because the devil has blinded our minds and we don't see the unity that we really already are in Christ. And so therefore, we're trying to unify ourselves and unify the body of Christ when we already are that. Now, it's only going to come together as we stand together in faith and, to, and declare that we already are one in Christ. That, and you see, as we stand in faith, then we will come to the knowledge of the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. And so, so now I'm going to turn back to Hebrews because what Hebrews is saying is this is only possible because our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it says it in the book of Romans, is our intercessor. He's still interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. And let me read you that verse in Romans chapter 8. It says this. In Romans chapter 8, it says, um, Who is he that condemns? Is it Christ that died? Yea, rather, that is risen again? who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? He's asking a question. Who are you here? If you're hearing condemnation today, who are you? Who is condemning you? Is it Christ? No. That, I mean, the, it's a rhetorical question because the obvious answer is no, it's not Christ. You're hearing from the devil if you're being condemned, if you're a Christian. Now, I'm not saying that we justify our sins. No, I'm not saying that. But we can stand by faith that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. You see, now we're justified before God. We stand by faith to see that. And that is true about us. Now, then why are you still condemned about these things? Why are you still taking condemnation? Is it Christ that condemns you? No, it's the devil. Christ is not condemning you. He's at the right hand of the Father interceding. He's your great high priest. That's exactly what it's saying there in the book of Hebrews. Now listen to what it says about a high priest. And this is going to go into the heavenly realms where we can really get a real vision of what Jesus as the high priest has done. And what the high priest, uh, Aaron, his office, actually what he accomplished, which God is not criticizing. He's just saying that's partial. You see, that's only a form, a shadow of the truth. Jesus is the great high priest. And that's why the uh, letter to the Hebrews is saying Jesus is m far greater than um, the Aaron office of high priesthood. It says this. Uh, it starts telling you what a high priest it, it is like. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, you see, but was at all points tempted like we are yet without sin. Think of Jesus. Think of what he went through in his earthly life. He went through every form of trial and temptation. He was tempted by the devil. He was tempted by the Pharisees. He, the trials that he, every minute of his life, he, it was under threat. So the Hebrew writer is saying to the Hebrew, the Christian Jews in Jerusalem, Look at your high priest and what he experienced. Do you think that you're not going to experience the same thing? It's not true. He experienced all those things. He was tempted in all ways, yet without sin, meaning he was tempted even to turn back, maybe like you are, but not. he didn't go into unbelief. He did not make a willful choice into unbelief. That's exactly what these Christians are in danger of, of making a willful choice to turn back to Judaism. That's really, the, uh, with. but Jesus, of course, went forward. It says, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace. Don't go back to the law in, of Judaism. Turn boldly and go boldly into the throne of grace. This is yours. 
that you may obtain, obtain mercy and find grace in help to help in time of need. This is where you're going to find the grace if you turn towards Jesus for what might be coming to you. You turn towards Jesus and the grace and the power is there. The, the supernatural life of Christ is within you already. And you turn towards him and that you will experience that supernatural power that transcends you above what's happening to you in, the, in on the earthly realm. And then it goes on to say in chapter 5, For every priest taken and from men is ordained for men to things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now it's talking about Aaron's office. Who can have compassion on the ignorant, on them that are out of the way, for he himself also is compassed with infirmities. It's saying that don't think that Jesus himself or even Aaron didn't go through all kinds of trials and temptations just because they had this high place. You know, everybody thinks Jesus would, you know, did not suffer. Well, he did. He suffered temptation and trials. It's because the word temptation is also interchanged with trial in the, in the Greek. It certainly is. Remember the verse in the, at the end of chapter 2, it says, For in that he himself, talking about Jesus, has suffered being tempted, and that means trials as well, is able to help them that are tempted that have trials and temptations. So go to him, it says, and obtain mercy and grace, the grace to go through what you're going through. No, So maybe you're not going to be uprooted like these or these early Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, and you're not going through that trial, but maybe you're going through a trial in your life. Maybe your whole family's being uprooted for things that's financial worries and um, things that might be happening to your family life. Maybe it's being torn up by um, your, ham your, your family it, through divorce or through uh, uh, terrible things that might be happening in your, in your family life. Maybe this is happening to you as well. You see, turn towards the one that is able to understand you because he's been through it himself and go obtain mercy from him, Jesus, and know that he has grace for you to walk through this very trial and temptation. And you can walk through it victoriously or you can walk through it with self-pity. You can walk through, through it worried about yourself all the time and uh, your self problems, or you can w walk, and you'll be defeated if you do, but you can raise your attention to the truth of what's really going on and the truth of Christ who is in you, who is able to cause you to stand in these trials and temptations that might be befalling you, besetting you. And by the way, I've just written a little book called That Which Besets Us or Besets You, so that's also on the inner net on spiritbroadcasting.net and on the liberatingsecret.org. Uh, all right, it says, so uh, our great high priest is not ignorant of the things that you're going through because he was tempted in every way. You're saying, well, Jesus was God though. Yes, but he came in human flesh and blood. So he suffered it. He, he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. So don't tell me that he was not afflicted with all of the same trials and temptations. And he, get, he walked it through for you in your place. So you take, you walk through it with him. Because the Bible says if you suffer with him, with him, you'll reign with him. That means if you're, try, if you're going through this thinking that you're by yourself and God's, Christ is off in the heaven somewhere, but it says, no, if you suffer with him, so if you declare he's with you, you see, you will fear no evil. That's, that's exactly what the scripture says. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You see, because you're going to walk through it uh, victoriously with a victorious one giving you the grace and the mercy and, uh, the, supp and the supplied life to walk through anything and everything that might be happening in, in you and to you. And by this reason, therefore, we ought as for people, so also for himself, to offer the sins. Uh, you see, that's what gave him the authority to be our great high priest is because he's walked our 
walk. He's been where we've been. He's suffered what we've suffered. It says, and, but no man takes this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So, and then it says in the next verse, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Okay, so, um, uh, so Jesus did not even say, say okay, I'm going to fulfill that office of high priest. He didn't claim that to himself. It was not a self-proclaimed office. So many times, so many of, of so many people of the Lord have self-acclaimed offices. Well, uh, even Jesus himself was not self-proclaimed at all. He, he was called of God. Now, uh, Paul was continually, he continually says that I was called of God. And I say that about my calling, that I did not uh, proclaim, you know, my calling myself, but I, I've been called by God to give the precious saints of God, the liberating truth. And, um, and it wasn't my idea. It was God that thrust me into this. I never thought I could do it, or I never thought that this were even possible. And the Lord has called me into it. And it's His mercy, His grace that I live by, His mighty resurrection power that I'm able to proclaim these precious truths to the body of Christ. So Jesus Himself did not glorify Himself by calling himself to it. Even at his baptism, it was the Holy Spirit. It was his father that said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And also, um, it says, it, the Holy Spirit also spoke from the heavenlies at his transfiguration. When he was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he took his three disciples up with him and his, his uh, clothes were... Uh, he was transformed, and, I, you know, I have my own little understanding about that, which I might bring out someday to you, but right now I don't want to go into it. But at that time, uh, the Holy Spirit spoke from heaven and said, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So, as he said also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So God anointed Jesus Christ as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And the next time we come together, um, we're going to talk some more about Melchizedek. And I think in the seventh chapter, I'm going to um, get out another one of my little booklets about who was Melchizedek, this mysterious person. We're going to discuss that a little bit. But right here, he's making the point that the high priest, Aaron, the high priest, had an earthly office, but Jesus had a heavenly office after the order of Melchizedek. It was not the same as Aaron's um, office that was of car carnal ordinances and uh, the sprinkling of the animals' sacrifices. This is a heavenly calling and a heavenly priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, and which is very interesting because Melchizedek, it said of him, and we're going to read more about him in chapter 7, it says that he, this mysterious one, had no earthly genealogy. So it's as if he were a heavenly person. So that's why um, Jesus is, uh, his office is after the order of Melchizedek. And it says of Jesus, and I love this verse, who in the days of his flesh offered supplication with, with strong crying. So we think, well, Jesus didn't really suffer what you're going through. Don't think that. Listen to this. Who in the days of his flesh, and uh, he offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him. Remember in Gethsemane when he said, take this cup from me, strong crying and tears. You tell me Jesus didn't suffer what you're suffering unto him that is able to save him from death. And of course, that's God his Father. And was heard in that he feared. We don't think of Jesus as fearing. Well, he did. I mean, he had strong apprehensions about going to the cross. And he, drops of blood, we, uh, sweat was drops of blood. We haven't, we haven't been under that kind of tension yet in our lives. So we don't know what kind of tension that was that he was facing there in Gethsemane. 
and um, crying out to God, take this cup from me, take this cup from me. And finally, we know he said, oh, no, 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 no. This is the Father's cup. Shall I not take it? So he knew that it was the Father's cup. He surrendered to the Father's cup by seeing, not my will, not what I'm tempted. I'm tempted to want to escape this horrible death. But no, no, no. I'm one with my Father. And we'll talk about that later at a different time. But it said this, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. See, this is preparing the Jewish, the Jewish Christians to realize that suffering, their great high priest has suffered greatly, the same suffering that they had. But it was the very means that God used to cause him to understand how to stand by faith in the midst of the suffering, you see, and divide the difference between soul and spirit. We're going to talk about that when we come back. But let me read you this final verse. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That means by faith. Called of God, a, a, a great high priest after the order of Melchizedek, that eternal order again. We're going to talk about that when we come back. Thank you so much for joining me today. And um, thank you. I'm just knowing that there's so many of you out there who are experiencing very hard, trying times. Temptation is what we do with what's happening to the trials outside of us. Trial is what's happening to us on the outside. Temptation is what we do with that trial that's happening to us on the outside. What is there to do? Well, inside you can stay in your own self-pity and tears and uh, wanna, you know, wanna escape, or you can go deeper into the Lord Jesus. This is actually meant to be there to drive you more into the truths of Christ and into the final victory that will raise you to the heavenly places so that you can know that you actually participate in the Lord's ascension, that you too can know what it means to be a king priest, because that's what Revelation is saying. The revelation of Jesus Christ is saying the body of Christ is really a king and a priest. A king because we know our authority in Christ, and a priest because we're living sacrifices and we offer up the sacrifice of praise, which is well-pleasing unto God. So I'm going to close now, and uh, I trust that the Holy Spirit has ministered to your heart through this program. In Jesus' precious name, we commit this to Him. And goodbye for today.